This is Guy Burgess. For this post, I'd like to try to explain why we think that massively parallel peace building isn't such a crazy idea. There are obviously lots of good reasons to be skeptical about a bold idea like this, and um, questions about whether or not people could actually contribute to this, and certainly worries about what happens if it doesn't. Uh, so, to answer some of these concerns, uh, we might start by citing uh, Kenneth Boulding's first law, if it exists, it must be possible, and if it has been done, it must be possible, the obvious corollary. And the truth is that there are lots of people doing things that, while they're not labeled massively parallel peace building, that's really what they are, and we just need to learn from those folks. Another example worth citing is Kenneth Boulding's story about the demise of dueling. There was a time when dueling was considered a perfectly reasonable way of resolving disputes. And there was a time when people trained to be better at uh, sword fighting or marksmanship or whatever, so they could prevail in disputes. And then society as a whole said, hey, this is a stupid way to handle conflict. And instead of learning how to fight better, they found alternative ways of resolving disputes and dueling disappeared. In a very real sense, what we need to do is to take today's destructive conflict handling practices, recognize how destructive they are, and find alternative ways of dealing with those same tough issues, but doing so in a more constructive way. Still another way to think about massively parallel peace building is it's just an effort to strengthen society's natural learning systems. Uh, ecodynamics and social ecodynamics, what have driven society, what has transformed the human race from primitive hunter-gatherers uh, today's, to today's modern industrial information economy, just in the space of a few thousand years. That's an astonishing accomplishment, and it's been done by a decentralized process where humans have learned how to deal with a wide range of issues uh, more effectively. And all we're really trying to do is to find ways to strengthen this system and extend it into the social realm and beyond just the making of tools. Yet another way to think about this is that conflict is a problem, and the thing about problems is they all create opportunities. Necessity is the mother of invention and all of that. So for all of the different aspects of the destructive conflict problem, there are associated opportunities for people to actually um, make a living helping society deal with these issues. The key is to be able to persuade that, hey, I've got a strategy that will really work. Um, yet another source of optimism um, is I think that what we're talking about with massively parallel peace building could actually go a long way towards harnessing uh, the make a difference drive of so many young people and so many older people for that matter. Uh, I know a lot of our my students have been very committed to in one way or another making a positive difference in the world. And the truth is that they've been having a tough time finding places in which they can do that. I think massively parallel peace building outlines a whole lot of opportunities. It just takes people with an entrepreneurial spirit to figure out how to develop them. Another image, um, and this is sort of an appeal to civic and patriotic responsibility, is a military concept, uh, not on our watch. And certainly in the Navy, there's a time when you're on watch, and the thing that you don't want to have happen is some disaster because you failed to fulfill your responsibilities when it was your watch. And I think we all need to cultivate this sense that we've been trying to make this democratic experiment work now for a couple of hundred years, or maybe going back further than that. And we have a responsibility to maintain it on our watch. Um, there are a lot of precedents of massively parallel peace building or that kind of approach, massively parallel efforts to do all sorts of things. Uh, one of the big examples is the United States in World War II, which is obviously pretty extreme, but it's a 
a story in which the entire society recognized that its survival depended on everybody doing what they could to contribute to the war effort. And I've not heard of any, you know, if I'm thinking back about my stories and my parents told and their friends told about the war, um, I don't think I ran into anybody who wasn't in some meaningful way involved in the war effort, uh, going all the way to little old ladies who spent their time knitting sweaters and caps for the sailors. Um, yeah, Rosie the Riveter who built the airplanes and the ships and all of that, plus obviously the soldiers who fought. One of the lines that my parents taught me from World War II was this phrase, the difficult we do right away, the impossible takes a bit longer. That kind of collective can-do spirit is something that we need to find some way to cultivate, but hopefully not without the extreme provocation of a world war. A little simpler, but I think still very instructive example of a massively parallel effort to do something is the open source software uh, movement. And this website uh, runs all on open source software, um, includes Linux and Drupal and PHP and MySQL and Apache. And I want to explain a little bit how Drupal works, which is just one of these, and it gives you a sense of a model of people coming together to do big things out of the sense of civic responsibility. Uh, for the most part, folks aren't paid for doing this, though they might be paid by businesses that they work for that are contributing their time as part of this broader effort to build a software platform that everyone can use. Uh, but Drupal, which is the software that Beyond Intractability uses, is actually a collective uh, collection of modules or programs that do all sorts of different things. And if you go onto our website, you can, at least as an administrator, you can get a list of all the different modules uh, that we use. And then you go into one of those modules, and this is true for all of them. And it has a list. Uh, over on the left is a list of all the releases. That's all the new versions of the module that have come out uh, over the last seven years. And then with each one uh, comes a list of changes that were added during those, and they're associated with an actual person that volunteered, okay, I'm going to do this little thing to help make this broad module a better program. And then over on the right is a list of what they call committers. These are people who have made a commitment to help write and maintain this particular module or program. And in a sense, we sort of need something like that for conflict. And there's this huge array of open source software programs that have all been written in this way. And in many respects, this is some of the most powerful software on the, the web. Another precedent is the environmental movement. The environmental movement starts by making an interesting distinction that applies to the uh, conflict field as well between point and non-point pollution sources. And early in the environmental movement especially, there were these point pollution sources, giant smokestacks that spewed out staggering amounts of terrible pollutants. And part of the movement was focused on cleaning those up. But we also realized that a huge part of the pollution problem was non-point sources. That's all of the people driving cars and having inefficiently insulated houses and all of these individual activities that contributed to the environmental problem. This insight is perhaps best summarized in the famous Pogo cartoon, We've Met the Enemy and He is Us. And the truth is, the enemy with respect to conflict is us. It's everybody who in one way or another contributes to the destructive way in which we handle conflict. At any rate, the environmental movement in response to all of this spawned this gigantic collection of environmental interest groups. And this is just a partial list and a 
link to a much more complete list. And each of these interest groups uh, specialize, uh, both in terms of theories of change, how they think they can influence society in a way that will push it towards more environmentally sound practices, public education and awareness uh, building, uh, trying to promote voluntary behavior change, uh, technological innovation, promotion of green products, green, green products of one sort or another, legal prohibitions against environmentally damaging activities, and so on and so forth. Uh, some groups specialized in litigation, some lobbying, some regulatory action, some electoral politics. So you had a wide array of groups using a wide array of, of theories of change operating in a wide array of conflict arenas. And that's what's made the environmental movement the force that it is today. Yet another window into all of this is this Wikipedia page, which lists all of the different organizations involved in the climate change issue. And again, this is an example of a massively parallel effort to deal with the problem. Climate change is also a good example of the principle that problems create opportunities and that those opportunities are things that people can build careers around and sometimes get rich pursuing. Uh, the development of wind power and solar power to the point where it's now economically competitive with fossil fuels is an astonishing accomplishment. And it's one that also envi advances environmental goals. Now this distinction between point and non-point sources also applies to conflict. There are, of course, point source conflicts. Uh, for my lifetime, the Kremlin has always been sort of at the focus of an awful lot of conflict issues. But it's also true that lots and lots of conflict emerges from the grassroots efforts and actions of individuals. Um, throughout the United States and around the world. Just like the environmental movement, there is a peace building movement. And this is a list of a few of the organizations that are actually organizations of organizations that are bringing together a very wide array of interesting groups that are each working on different aspects of the conflict problem. While it's not as extensive or dominant as the environmental movement, it's certainly a good solid place to start and there's much there that we can learn from and build on. Uh, you can also go to Vote Smart, which maintains lists of interest groups and you'll find that there are also interest groups working on a wide array of other critical conflict problems that are sort of in adjacent fields to this core peace building and conflict resolution. Uh, this is the beginning of the listing of folks who are looking at campaign finance and election and the domination of politics by those with an awful lot of money. Uh, there's another set that are working on social justice and equity and inequality and preserving entitlements and protecting the social safety net and all of that. Uh, there's yet another set that's working on uh, governmental operations and trying to make uh, democratic governments actually live up or come closer to living up to the democratic ideal. And there are a wide range of advocacy groups. And this goes back to the constructive confrontation idea that we highlighted in an earlier post. Um, and all of these interest groups are trying to defend the interests of their constituents, and they could all benefit from understanding conflicts dynamics in ways that would make them more effective both over the near term and the long term. And the last thing to talk about with respect to why this isn't such a crazy idea is how you can get the resources to do all of this. Uh, certainly there is human resources. I've already mentioned a lot of young college graduates that are looking for ways to make a difference they're entering a job market that isn't making very good use of their talents. I think this is an enormous growth opportunity. Uh, the trick is to figure out how to make it work. Uh, sometimes I tell my students that this is the next big thing, like a smartphone. If you can figure out how to build 
a series of institutions and organizations that address different aspects of the conflict problem. It could be enormously valuable uh, to the society as a whole and uh, therefore a source of some revenue. Another key to making this all work is finding ways to bring costs down. Uh, the iron law of supply and demand is true. The demand for more constructive approaches to conflict uh, will go up if the price goes down. So you need to figure out how to do this as efficiently as possible. Uh, one strategy for doing this and is to focus not on building alternative strategies. So you've got a whole parallel set of institutions, uh, but improving the behavior of existing institutions. Uh, this was one of uh, an our earlier criticisms of the alternative dispute resolution movement. It tried to somehow create an alternative set of processes that operated next to the existing dispute resolution institutions. Uh, we argued then that we need to focus more on improved dispute resolution, that is making existing institutions work better, and that gets you out of this terrible turf war conflict between alternatives and business as usual practices. So I think that makes sense. And there's also the opportunity for new funding streams. Um, if you can demonstrate that not only is the conflict problem as serious as climate change, but that there are constructive, realistic things you can do to address it, which is something that we're trying to do with this massively parallel peace building concept, then I think you've got a chance it actually springing loose some big bucks from foundations that might be willing to devote a billion or two billion dollars to underwriting a grant program that could enable an awful lot of things to get started. Uh, there's also an opportunity for civic action, uh, people just volunteering to roll up their sleeves and figure out how to do things. And it doesn't have to be just building trails. You can roll up your sleeves and figure out how to deal with the conflicts in your community more constructively. And that's what we're trying to do with massively parallel peace building. Uh, we've broken into 10 major categories, the kinds of things people can do to help. And within those, there are a lot of subcategories describing specific things. Right now we have over a hundred of these items, uh, which sounds pretty daunting. But what we're talking about is a massively parallel effort involving millions of people ultimately. So the thought of having millions of people work on 100, 150 problems isn't quite so unrealistic. At any rate, in the next post, we'll go into detail on what each of these action items looks like and give you a sense of where we go from here.